Hello and welcome once again to this series of slide videos from the Cornish Radio Amateur Club. This is the second in our um, series on receivers, so it's receivers B. In receivers A for the advanced course we looked at some of the characteristics of a receiver and how we might um, measure them and understand them better. In receivers B we're going to look at how the superhead helps us achieve a lot of these desirable characteristics or features. So first of all, let's look at the advantages of a superhead over a tuned radio frequency receiver. Now, with tuned radio uh, frequency receivers, um, to achieve adequate selectivity, and once again, I would say you need to look at receivers A first if you're approaching this video uh, without having uh, looked at it. Um, if, you, if we want to obtain adequate uh, selectivity, uh, we need several tuned circuits cascaded in a row, if you like. And these would all have to track the signal frequency exactly um, and be therefore ganged, and this is quite difficult to achieve. Um, in a TRF uh, receiver, the RF amplifiers must work over a wide frequency range. Um, so if we had, for example, an HF receiver and we wanted it to be TRF, we would expect the um, uh, frequencies to be uh, working that we're able to work from 3 to 30 megahertz and again that would be quite difficult to achieve and at the higher end of the band we would have to achieve we'd have to achieve very very high Q factor um, filters not only would they have to be trackable but they'd have to have high Q in order to get the uh, selectivity that we would need to be able to reject adjacent channels so, let's have a look at an example of this. Here we have um, a, a curve showing the full power point and the 0.707 point, or uh, half power, or minus 3 dB. So, um, the bandwidth there is shown between um, uh, F1 and F2, with F0 being the center frequency. Now you remember from a previous video that Q equals F0 over F2 minus F1. In other words, the center frequency over the bandwidth. So let's have a look at some examples. Let's have a look at um, MF and VHF. Well, in the blue box there, you can see an example at MF. Uh, there's a medium wave receiver. And um, at 1 MHz, which is in the medium wave or MF band, um, and if we desired a, an AM bandwidth of, say, 7 kHz, uh, then we would have to design a filter with a Q of 143, and that wouldn't be uh, beyond the realms of possibility. Uh, but in, in example 2, at VHF, um, if we were looking at, say, 100 MHz, that's in the uh, VHF band bandwidth. Remember, from 30 to 300 megahertz is in the VHF um, uh, band. Then, uh, 100 over 180 kilohertz. That might be the the bandwidth we might need for a music FM uh, transmission. And you can work out that using Carson's rule. Um, then you might need a Q of 555 for it to be selective, and that would be very very difficult indeed to achieve. So we have to look at um, solutions on, on how to do this. Remembering again that uh, Q is equal to F0, that's the center frequency, over the bandwidth, F2 minus F1. And that the bandwidth is measured at the half power, or 3 dB points. Well, we've already looked at the SuperHet receiver during the intermediate course. Uh, and here is a block diagram that is um, shown in the uh, RSGB book Advance. So here we have um, the various stages of the superhead receiver. We have um, a frequency coming in, F1, that would be our, our desired frequency. And we mix that um, with a frequency from a local oscillator, F2. And at the output of the mixer, we will have F1 plus F2, and we will have F1 minus F2, but also we will have F1 and F2 themselves. So it's worth being, bearing in mind that 
mixes are not ideal in as much as they don't only produce the frequency that we want. We have to use subsequent filtering to pick out the uh, frequency we want. So here's a classic approach then, F1 coming in, F2 from the uh, uh, local oscillator, and the ones of interest to us, F1 plus F2 and F1 minus F2, the so-called sum and difference frequencies. So, um, these sum and difference frequencies are then fed into um, uh, an IF amp. Now, it isn't just an amplifier, it's a filter as well. And the first IF amp, the main purpose of it, is to uh, select roughly the uh, frequencies that we require. So, if for example, this um, super heterodyne receiver was uh, designed to select the uh, difference frequencies, then the IF amplifier needs to reject the sum frequencies. And so, uh, it would be a, a low-pass filter, and the low-pass filter might look something like that. So there we have the difference frequency shown in green passing through, and this first IF stage um, rejecting the sum frequency, which is quite a long way away. So at that point then, we've got uh, F1 minus F2 selected, F1 and F2, which have also snuck through in, in lower levels perhaps, depending on the design of the mixer, um, but those being uh, rejected as well. So, just looking then at the um, uh, situation there, that, that's the classic view of F1, F2 coming in, and F1 minus F2 being selected. Now, of course, at the antenna, it won't only just be F1. There will be, perhaps, some adjacent signals. And they're shown right next to F2. They're perhaps um, in, in an amateur band. Uh, during a contest, you'll find some signals just a few kilohertz up and a few kilohertz down. Well, they're shown there in red, next to the green signal that we're tuned to. And you can see that um, those adjacent signals um, also manage to get through the low-pass filter. So, so far, we haven't done very much to improve selectivity. So this is where the second IF amp comes in. Second IF amp then would be a bandpass filter and it would be there to try and produce uh, excellent selectivity for the superhead. So if that was in there it might have a response something like the graph there shown on the right. Um, a high Q filter because remember that the IFs are not tracking filters they're just made for a single IF frequency be it 470 kilohertz or 10.7 kilohertz to quote some common IFs. So there we are, and you can see there in red the um, adjacent signals have been well attenuated by the second IF uh, filter. So if we go back to the um, superhead there, we've managed uh, not only then to uh, select the uh, difference frequencies, F1 minus F2, but we've also managed there to do a good job at getting rid of the um, uh, adjacent channel interference. Let's take an example of this. There's a superhead again, and if we had a frequency of 145 megahertz as the desired frequency, the frequency we want to tune to, then after the RF amplifier, which is an RF amplifier and a filter for reasons we'll see in a minute, but a fairly broadband filter, um, we will also find 145 megahertz, but at a slightly higher level, or much higher level, than coming in from the antenna. That will be fed into the mixer and mixed with a local oscillator. And in this case, the local oscillator is 134.3 megahertz. So, that will produce um, the sum and difference fre frequencies. It'll produce 145 uh, plus 134.3, which is 279.3 megahertz, 
and it also produced the difference frequency of 10.7 MHz. And 10.7 MHz would be the IF frequency that we're looking for. So there they are, the two frequencies there going into the IF amplifier. But the selectivity of the IF amplifier, the low pass filter, easily managing to filter off the 10.7 MHz uh, signal and reject the 279.3 MHz signal. Uh, we then go through the second IF amplifier, which if you remember provides good selectivity for us. And at this point uh, it goes into the detector. Now this detector will depend on the type of modulation scheme uh, used and we'll look at detectors in a subsequent video. But for now we can assume that the detector does its job and then we come out at the other side uh, with say 2 kHz signal, that being about the mid-range of our voice signals from 300 to 3 kilohertz um, and uh, that would be boosted up through an audio amplifier and subsequently a, a power amplifier uh, and come out uh, of the speaker of the receiver. So there we have it again um, F1 coming in, the uh, sum and difference frequencies being produced uh, the difference frequency being selected and we now need to consider something that happens when we look at these frequencies and we're going to consider now the image channel so if we say F1 is coming through uh, from the um, into the antenna and uh, F1 and F2 um, are producing the sum and difference frequencies as they're mixed together um, then that's the situation we've got, the classic sum and difference frequencies. But also, this is spoiled by the fact that other frequencies or mixing products also exist, and there are many of them. Of interest is the so-called uh, image frequency, so that's F2 minus F1. And there we have the image channel, as it's quite often called. Now, um, if we have a look at the image channel um, and if we look at a receiver and in this case we've um, used the example that's given in the RSGB book advance um, and that was for a television with a 36 megahertz IF signal the input frequency the TV channel tuned to 503.25 now I would point out that these frequencies are no longer used um, uh, uh, you know, because of the rebanding in the UK for, for digital TV, but the example remains valid nonetheless. So we've got 503.25 coming in and we want 36 MHz for our IF. So that means that if we choose the um, difference frequencies, the uh, F1 minus F2, that would imply that we have a local oscillator of 467.25 MHz. So I think that's uh, in line with what we've understood so far. F1, 503.25, minus 467.25 gives us 37, uh, big pardon, 36 MHz IF, which then goes on to the stages of filtering and detection. So here's the route, and that's quite satisfactory. Now I think we've learned that the image frequency is um, twice the IF away from the desired frequency. So if we had a signal at 431.25, and you know inevitably there will be occasions when there are signals that are twice the IF away from our required frequencies, um, and if we look at the route then of uh, F2 minus F1, so that's 467.25 minus 431.25, that also gives us 36 megahertz. And that is the exact same frequency as our desired frequency. Now, our hope is that that signal will be at a low level because the RF amplifier, as I explained a bit earlier, is not just an amplifier, it's a filter. It's a low Q filter, but 
the image frequency is twice the IF away from the desired frequency and so it doesn't have to be a very high filter. Nevertheless, um, the um, signal will sneak through and appear on top of the desired frequency. And so subsequent stages, the IF amplifiers, have no way of distinguishing between the two signals and they're amplified equally. So as I said, we hope that the uh, image channel is at a lower level and we're relying on the RF amplifier, which has a filter component in it, to do the job of suppressing the image channel. So, um, let's have a look now at the implications of this um, on um, our choice of local oscillator frequency. First of all, let's say, well, uh, if you can look at the slide there, you'll see that um, the difference between 431.25 and 503.25 is twice the IF. And that's the crucial point to remember for the uh, RSGB syllabus. So, choice of local oscillator. There's the uh, first few blocks again. And if we chose an IF, for example, of 470 kilohertz, we can choose the local oscillator to either track above or track below our desired frequency. So we can either use F1 plus F2, the sum frequencies, sum mixing products, or F1 minus F2, the difference mixing products. So let's see what we choose, and it's a matter of design. If we have a classic medium wave receiver, such as one we might find in our car, 600 kHz to 1600 kilohertz, and we've chosen a, an IF, as I say, of uh, 470 kilohertz, then um, our F1 plus F2 frequencies will be 1070 kilohertz to 207 kilohertz. In other words, the local oscillator will have to uh, cover a range of about two, from its lowest frequency to its highest frequency. And that's very achievable. So that's a scheme where we would say, well, okay, we're going to track um, and, and, and take the, the sum frequencies, the F1 plus F2. Um, <clears throat> so there we go. Um, and let's have a look and see if we took the F1 minus F2. Well, here we would have 130 kilohertz to 1130 kilohertz, and that would be a range of 8.7 times. So that's quite a, a big range and therefore be a quite difficult to achieve. So choice of local oscillator frequency um, can be affected by how much we want it to track. Now this example is given at MF and um, it tends to exaggerate the differences as you move up higher into HF and then into VHF, the differences are not so acute. So, let's have a move on then and say, well, okay, um, the choices are based on a number of factors, the difficulty of designing the operator at those, uh, uh, the, the oscillator at those frequencies, um, but also the range over which the local, uh, local oscillator has to tune. Now let's discuss the choice of IF frequency. Um, there is a schematic, if you like, of the first few uh, blocks of the SuperHEP receiver. The signal in green, the desired one, and the uh, uh, image coming in, the red coming in, to the RF amplifier. And this time, instead of just writing RF amp, we've shown it as a bandpass filter and um, an amplifier. And um, that is ganged, or works off the same knob, as the local oscillator tuning. So as you increase the um, uh, tuning on the local oscillator, the RF amplifier filter will also track. And the idea then is that the image frequency is um, rejected as much as possible by the tracking of the RF amplifier. So again, the choice of the IF frequency will depend on a number of factors. Uh, the image frequency, remember, is the signal frequency plus twice the IF frequency. So, uh, the higher the um, 
uh, IF, the greater the gap between the desired signal and the image signal. And if that gap is wider, it's easier then for the RF amplifier to be able to distinguish between the two and filter out the image frequency. But conversely, with a low IF, it'll be easier to achieve a high Q for the IF filters, so that there's this trade-off. Let's examine this trade-off in the next slide. Here we've got two tracks, if you like, from left to right, where we're going to look at a low um, frequency IF, perhaps something like 470 kilohertz, and then we're going to look in the bottom row at a higher frequency IF and compare the two. So, if the signals, we start with the signals there on the left, and the green line is our wanted signal. And next to the wanted signal we have um, an adjacent channel interfering. That's quite close by. And uh, two times the IF away, which is not so far because it's a low IF, uh, we have our um, image frequency. So let's have a look at these um, signals going through the front-end response curve. There's a front-end response curve and uh, if we look at the signals then superimposed on it, we see that the wanted signal is fine. The adjacent signal has been attenuated a little bit by the curve, but not very much because it's a low Q circuit in the front end, but that the uh, image frequency was far enough away to be attenuated quite a bit. Nevertheless, when we get to our IF, we have a high Q circuit because at a low IF it's easier to design a, 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 a circuit with um, uh, a good um, response uh, and steep skirts. And uh, we have the um, a wanted signal, but the unwanted image signal has come through because it's been let through by the front end. So we have some interference happening there. Uh, conversely though, the adjacent signal has been well filtered because it's outside the skirts of the um, steep IF uh, response. So that's the story for a low IF. Let's have a look at the same story then for a higher IF. Well here you can see that the IF frequency is further away from the wanted frequency um, than uh, in the low IF example above. And the reason is that it's two times IF away, and if IF is greater, it's further away. The adjacent si signal is exactly the same. If we look at the front end response, we see that the front end has done a better job. It's the same uh, front end response curve as above, and nothing's changed there by the selection of IF, um, but that the uh, front end has done a better job of filtering out the image frequency because it's further away from the wanted frequency um, because of the choice of IF. However, the adjacent signal gets through just the same. If we look at then the IF filter, well it's more difficult to build a narrowband filter at a higher frequency, so I've shown a slightly wider response. And if we superimpose the signals on that, we see that the I, uh, the image frequency is well attenuated, the wanted, uh, but still slightly superimposed on the wanted signal, um, but that the um, adjacent channel hasn't been um, attenuated to the degree of the low IF because of the um, steep curves on the uh, low IF. So if we were going to generalize, we could say, for example, a low IF would give poor image rejection but good selectivity and a high IF would, good, would give good image rejection but poor selectivity. So there we are. Um, I think that just about sums up the SuperHet receiver and what you need to know about it for the RSGB advanced exam. Uh, please look at this video in conjunction with the book. The examples have been um, taken from the book. Um, and I hope this makes it a bit clearer. Um, 
in the next uh, video we'll continue to look at the double superhead which if you like can um, give advantages of um, both low IF and higher IF um, and we'll go on to look at some of the uh, circuitry contained within the uh, block diagrams in a bit more detail. So thank you very much uh, once again and uh, I look forward to presenting to you in Receivers C.